I hope you've been enjoying the Ask Anything series. Uh, we've been covering a lot of different things. Uh, Catholicism, raising children, dating, uh, what happens when we die, the gospel, uh, everything. But um, it, it is difficult choosing the right question each week. And uh, I've, tr I've tried to hit a variety of topics so far. Um, also something that is going to help us in our lives. Not just, not just weird and obscure for the sake of it, uh, but something that's actually going to help us in our Christian lives. And so what I want to talk to you today about will at first possibly sound obscure, but it's not. So if you would, uh, hang with me as I read this question, and then I'll give you some more. The question today that we're answering comes from a young adult, and they write, How do you biblically respond to someone who believes in the law of attraction? Can they be a Christian and believe in this theory? So what is the law of attraction? It's a good question. Uh, to give a simple definition, it is a system of thought. It has nothing to do with people being attracted to each other. It's not another dating message, okay? Uh, to put it simply, the law of attraction says that your thoughts have attractional power to create realities in your life. When you think about something or when you declare something to be a magnetic force that exists in the universe, the theory says, draws that thing to you. Uh, it could be money, or power, or weight loss, or health, or success, or anything. So the philosophy boils down to this simple maxim. Your thoughts become things. To get what you want, the theory says, ask the universe. Make known to it what you want. Believe that it is already yours, and begin to feel that the thing you're asking for has already come to you. Focus on positive things, because... Uh, you cannot help the world focusing on negative things. To attract money, for example, focus on wealth. Visualize checks coming in the mail. Uh, think wealth all the time, and wealth will magnetically be drawn to you. We are creators, not only of our own destiny, but of the universe. Of the, the universe itself emerges from our own thoughts. The more you use the power, the more you have. The time to embrace your magnificence is now. Whatever you choose is right. The power is all yours. In case you're wondering what I just said, <laughs> that was, those were all quotations from a 2006 book called The Secret, written by Rhonda Byrne. I actually have it here in my office. Here's how informal we are. Hold that thought. And we're back. Okay. I found it. This is the book. This is an extremely popular book that has uh, really uh, pushed the cause of the law of attraction into the mainstream. So we'll talk about that. Um, the law of attraction in 2006, it existed prior to 2006, but it was not popular mainstream. Um, there was a film called The Secret that came out, and then quickly after, this book called The Secret came out. It immediately was popular. It was embraced by Oprah, who put it on her book list, who pushed it in her shows, which obviously gave it a big boost. The Secret has sold 35 million copies to date, and just for a reference point, uh, that's more than The Great Gatsby, The Hunger Games, or Who Moved My Cheese. But if this were simply just a little flash in the pan, a little book that came up to prominence in the mid-2000s and then went away, we wouldn't have much to talk about today. But a brief YouTube search will show that The Secret and... The broader law of attraction did not just stay with Oprah's middle-aged suburban woman's demographic, but has remained popular with the next generation of social media influencers, positivity bloggers, and Instagram inspiration gurus. So the titles you may see all over the internet would be uh, How to Improve Your Life Today, How to Manifest a Better Reality, The Power of Positive Thinking, or some other combination of words but make no mistake, that's the law of attraction that they're using. Uh, one month ago, a full-length studio movie came out called The Secret, Dare to Dream, uh, starring Katie Holmes and Josh Lucas, real actors and actresses, all right, with an actual budget. Additionally, on September, excuse me, November 24th, Rhonda Byrne is releasing a sequel to this book called The Greatest Secret. So I say all this to, to tell you, this is not a, a dying movement, it is a growing movement. There's more excitement about it today than there was. And given the great allure and the promise of the law of attraction, that your thoughts become things that you can speak truth into existence by your very words, 
that you can manifest realities with your thoughts, it has infiltrated the church and Christian thought and Christian pulpits. The most obvious places where it lurks are the pulpits of the obvious prosperity preachers, ones that you should be embarrassed to listen to, like Joel Osteen or T.D. Jakes or Benny Hinn or Todd White or Kenneth Copeland, calling us to name and claim our miracle, to manifest it by declaring it in Jesus' name. But it has also more inconspicuously found its way into the message of some of our most influential pastors, the coolest ones, with all the good music, unfortunately. Stephen Furtick of Elevation Church and all of his various fanboy copycat preachers may never utter the words, the law of attraction, but make no mistake, that philosophy is baked into every part of their sermons, especially as they consistently claim that a breakthrough is coming. A miracle is on the way. God is going to give you the victory. What kind of victory? The victory. Bear in mind, these words don't mean to them what they mean to you, uh, the breakthrough is not a breakthrough on dealing with your nagging sin problem. Neither is the victory a holy life or the proclamation of the gospel to a lost soul. And the miracle is not the straightening of a crippled leg or a blind eye being able to see. They carefully craft their messages to say, but not say, but also kind of say that Jesus exists to help you fulfill your American dreams of satisfaction, wealth, health, safety, and power. But as we look at what I will call the lie of attraction you will see that there is nothing distinctly Christian about it. And I hope to show you that it's promises to get what you want, when you want, by asserting your desires into the universe most resemble the temptation of Satan to derail the lives of God's people. The law of attraction is incompatible with Christianity because it exists only to feed your flesh what it already longs for, irrespective of Christ or the gospel. It is a system of thought that elevates gift above giver. I want to show you three common lies today perpetuated, yes, by the law of attraction, but also by Satan in our everyday lives as he seeks to tempt us. And my challenge to you will be this. Trust in the goodness of God and his plan for your life. Worship and serve the creator rather than created things or promises of vanity and worldly glory. Before we go to God's Word, would you pray with me? Father, I pray you'd use today in a powerful way. Uh, Lord, for someone who is trapped, ensnared in this way of thinking, Lord, who's been influenced by it, would you free their hearts and minds to see clearly the, the biblical way to know you, Lord? Father, would you put us in our place? Would you remind us of who we are and who you truly are? Lord, would you... Enliven your word today, and Lord, make it jump off the page. Move in our hearts today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's message will be a heavy one for the mind because uh, we're, we're kind of keeping up three streams of thought here. One is a critique of the law of attraction. One is a discussion of the temptation of Jesus. And the other is a discussion of the uh, fall in the Garden of Eden between Satan and Adam and Eve. Uh, go with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. This passage is known as the temptation of Jesus, and it's early in Jesus' ministry, right after his baptism. Uh, Jesus comes up out of the water. John has baptized him. The voice of the Father says from, from heaven, This is my beloved Son, well pleased. Spirit of God descends like a dove. Jesus is up, ready to go minister, and then, boom, he goes out to the wilderness to be tempted. Not what we expected. Look with me, Matthew 4, 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. 
Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Jesus successfully resists the temptation of Satan. I hope you see in this story there's really, uh, we reminded of the two archetypes of Scripture. where We can picture Adam and Eve in their perfect environment in the garden where everything was just set up for them to succeed, and yet they were tempted and fell. And then you see Jesus, who was in a harsh environment, who was in a weakened state, fasting, and Satan appeared to him, and yet he succeeded. In the Garden of Eden, in the wilderness with Jesus, Satan did the same thing both times. He goes and twists God's word, he lies, he makes promises based upon half-truths, and he offers worldly prizes in exchange for your very soul, and he's still doing that today. Church, this is what Satan continues to do, and it is what the law of attraction does. The first lie that I want to show you today, our outline will be things that are in common with Satan's lies and temptations, and also the law of attraction. So, number one, the first lie is that I should never experience trials. I should never experience trials. One of the primary tenets of the law of attraction held tightly by its followers is that you cannot help the world focusing on negative things. This is why Instagram is full of people trying to take pictures at the gym with an inspirational quote about their gains or their hard work. Or picture someone staring out over a lake with a gentle uh, breeze blowing their hair in a caption of them about achieving their dreams in life. In churches where sin is overlooked or treated almost like a curse word, it is replaced with the value of positive thinking. Trials, hardships, and suffering must be reinterpreted then as a failure on our part to manifest our destiny. In the law of attraction, there's no place for pain. It is not redemptive in any way. It's something to be uh, skirted past, to forget, to move on, to get to the next thing. And this type of thinking, in my opinion, has been laid bare by the coronavirus. You know, on one hand, I, I hope you watch our services only. On one hand, my selfish part. On the other hand, I hope that you go on Facebook or YouTube and you see what other churches are doing. And you listen to the messages of the most popular churches or the ones who are just the, the cool churches. Because in a lot of cases, not everyone, but in a lot of cases, pastors who have been accustomed to preaching their positive fluffy messages to thousands of smiling faces about how everything is just so wonderful and they're preaching to an empty room and online crowd only, who people are home actually suffering during this time. Their positive vibes don't stop the virus from coming. Their inspirational pep talk doesn't save the business from going under. The coronavirus has brought confusion to those who have had no category for suffering in their mind, in their worldview. And if you don't have a worldview that ascribes purpose or value or meaning to your life like Christ does, then you are susceptible to being extremely depressed during this time. Look back at Matthew 4, 1 for some context. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now we have to pause there. Let's ask a critical thinking question here. <laughs> Comprehension. Who led Jesus into the barren wasteland? The Spirit. Okay. Why did this happen? To be tempted by the devil. It's right in the verse. God will never put you in a tough spot, right? God will never lead you to a test of faith, right? If we experience suffering, it means something wrong is happening, right? Wrong. The Spirit led Jesus there early in his ministry. This was a trial to produce strength and perseverance. Listen to what James 1, 2 through 4 says. He says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So James says, tests and trials are good? They sanctify us? They refine us? Yes. Why would anybody fast? It's hard. It hurts. It's on purpose. 
<laughs> in the midst of Jesus' hunger, Satan comes up to Jesus in the middle of his hunger. Day 40 of a fast. I've, I've never made it that far. I'll be honest with you. That's really, really impressive. Uh, Satan comes up into a hunger that I could not understand on somebody else's part and says if you really are the son of god and by the way he was so since you are the son of god command these stones see this rock right here you know you could make it bread right and and, and in jesus mind he might have said yeah i could i could and he actually could satan's kind of saying hey let's see the manna shower one more time in the wilderness let's see let's make it rain bread because we know you can so we read into this what Satan is saying, not that he cares for Jesus, not that he's worried about him being hungry. Come on, we're talking about Satan here, the father of lies. So what is he getting at? Commentator Warren Wearsby imagines Satan's true intent as follows. Since you are God's beloved son, why doesn't your father feed you? Why did your father put you in this harsh wilderness? See, that's what Satan does. He gives subtle suggestions that your father does not love you. And every time you experience a pain or suffering or a trial, Satan's ready to show up with that little needle prick to say, you know this means God doesn't care about you, right? If he loved you, you'd never experience any hardship, trials, or pain. And we do that. We, we fall for that. We experience trials. Do we do what James says and we consider it an opportunity for steadfastness to grow in our sanctification? Or do we do what Satan suggested, that this trial must mean that God is distant? This trial must mean that God does not care. He does not love you. And so then we say, well, I need to take matters into my own hands. I need to get out there. I need to make it happen. Eve, God is not really good, Satan says. God is not really good. He doesn't want you to have this fruit. He doesn't want you to reach out and take it. Here, Eve, take the fruit. Jesus, God doesn't really love you. Look at how hungry you are. You can see your ribs. That's not something that a, a son of God looks like. Reach out and take these stones and turn them into bread. End your fast. There's no sense in pain. There's no sense in feeling difficulty. But Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. It's not about the bread, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. This time in the wilderness to Jesus was not a time to be avoided, but a time to draw near to God in his word. A time to draw near in the closeness of God, to experience God. Both Satan and the law of attraction will say a trial can never be for your good. Well, Joseph would have to disagree with that, wouldn't he? That's the first lie. The second lie, number two, that both Satan and the law of attraction promise is that, number two, I am at the center of the universe. I'm the center of the universe. It's all about me. The law of attraction unapologetically puts you in the center of the world. The secret, the book, says you are like a human transmission tower. Your thoughts create your future. You are like... I could not believe this. You are like a planet with your own orbit and gravitational pull. Repeat phrases over and over again like, I am strong. I am wealthy. I am smart. I am healthy. Your thoughts create your future. You have the power. The power is all yours. That's the secret. One fundamental reality of the law of attraction is that it is spiritual but not religious. It's spiritual but not Christian. There's plenty of talk about the universe. Maybe you've seen this in pop culture. The capital U universe. You can ask the universe things. The universe can do things for you and bring things your way. But this purposefully vague universe is still not the uh, supreme being in the new agey type of world that we've built here. It's because you are the supreme being in your world. You are the creator of reality in the law of attraction. The universe always responds to you. See, when if I'm thinking money, 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 it's the universe's job to all of a sudden send that thing my way. The universe is the genie, but the genie is not the master. The master is the one who rubs the lamp and makes the wish. Make no mistake, in law of attraction, you are the sovereign. 
How do we know this? In any situation, the one who can test the other to respond is in charge. The one who says jump is in charge, and the one who says how high is not. Look at Matthew 4, 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So this is a different type of temptation from Satan. They're now atop a very tall building, the temple, and Satan says, If you're really the Son of God, jump. Just jump off the side. Because the, here's why. Then he quotes Psalm 91 about God's protection of his people. And uh, the psalm is about God protects his people in a way unique to them and not to the other pagan nations surrounding. And so Satan says, all right, let's see if God is going to do what his word says. So you jump off this building. It says that he will command his angels concerning you. So you ought to be caught by angels before you hit the ground. Right, Jesus? Let's try it. Let's just see what happens. Now, remember what I said earlier. There's a big difference in God saying that he's going to protect us in situations that we encounter in life versus purposefully hurling ourselves off buildings and saying, well, God said he would. I mean, that's, that's called testing God. Now, remember, God can test us. Okay, God can test us. Count it all joy, brothers, when you receive trials of various kinds. But... Can we test God? No. Now you might be sitting at home saying, well, that's not fair. It's not fair. Why can God treat me different than I can treat him? Because he's God. That's why. Because he's a holy God and you're a creature, right? There's only one sovereign at the center of the universe and it's not you. It's God. If we demand that God does something or if we say, God, if you do this, then I'll do this. Or if we say, God, just you give me a sign and then I will do my part. We're testing God. We are putting God in a situation where his answer to our question will determine whether we find him to be faithful. We don't get to tell God to jump. Jesus didn't take the bait and he's got more authority than you do. So even Jesus knew not to test God. He quotes from Exodus chapter 17 uh, when he says, uh, don't put the Lord to the test. That's a story from Exodus where they uh, kind of pressured God to give them water from the rock. Um, we would be wise in general not to manufacture situations in our lives where we force God to perform a miracle to prove he's God. When the crowds pushed in on Jesus later in his ministry, they asked, prove yourself with a sign. Show us a sign. And Jesus said, an evil and adulterous generation asked for a sign and that the only sign they'll get is the sign of Jonah the resurrection. God doesn't appreciate being told to dance by creatures made from the dust, I'll tell you that. But as we look at the law of attraction, and pop culture leads us to believe that we are like little gods. There's even prosperity preachers that says that say we are little gods. And I would imagine it, it's probably quite exhausting to think of yourself as a little god, to be the center of your own universe. In the law of attraction, you have all the power. You are magnificent. Whatever you choose is right. The power is yours. Might I quote as a contrast, Romans eleven thirty three through 36. Paul writes, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. That's a vastly different picture, isn't it? How quickly we forget who we talk to and who we pray to. How quickly we forget who spoke the universe into existence with a word of his power. How quickly we forget who created who. We are not little gods. We are not little centers of our lives and our universe. We are not little creators or manifestors of our destiny. We have no authority to declare or demand that God do anything. Through a relationship with Jesus, 
Here's, here's Christian prayer. Through a relationship with Jesus, we get the privilege of being a son or daughter to God that we can ask our Father who loves us for needs that we have. And after we have seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, then yeah, all of those things get added to us. But Christian prayer is absolutely different than what the law of attraction is promising. Lie number one, you should never experience trials. Lie number two, I am the center of my universe. And lastly, the final lie of attraction, number three, I exist to serve created things. I exist to serve created things. Look with me at Matthew 4, 8 through 11. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministering to him. There's so much wrong here, it's hard to know where to start. But first of all, Jesus already has a scheduled appointment in the future where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess him as Lord. So Satan is promising something that he's already going to get in the future without Satan's help. So what's the catch? Why would this even be an offer from Satan? I guess the answer is that in Satan's proposal, Jesus can get the glory without having to go to the cross. Satan is saying, I'll give it to you right now. I'll give it to you now. You don't have to go through that process of the cross, the resurrection, and all of that. You can just have the power right now that Jesus could get the glory without the cross. This is a common tactic of Satan, by the way. He he uses it in our lives. He promises us cheap glory. He promises us a crown without a cross. But Jesus would not take this expedient path. He would not hang us out to dry. You see, if Jesus would have taken Satan's offer and just become the instant king, And by the way, at one time in Jesus' ministry, a big crowd tried this again. Let's make him king by force. And Jesus said no. If he took Satan's offer right here and became the king without the cross, you and I would have no answer for our sins. We would have no crucified Savior, no risen Lord who took away our burdens and paid our debts. Yes, salvation was hanging in the balance here. But your Savior did not take the cheap glory. He kept on the path to the cross. Secondly is the extreme irony here. Satan is a fallen angel. Now, angels are not eternal. They are not gods. They have more power and strength than maybe you and I do, but we get more of God's affection and love than they do. Consider the irony of being a created being like Satan, asking Jesus, the creator, to worship him in exchange for an accumulation of other created things. That's just theologically funny to me. The hope of Satan had to be that Jesus in his weakened state, in his fasting and loneliness, in his uh, time in the wilderness, in his fear of going to the cross, the, the pain that he would endure, that Jesus would take the deal with the devil. He would take everything the world would have to offer now without the pain of later, throwing God's plan for his Messiah under the bus and ruining all of redemptive history. That had to be Satan's plan. But Jesus again quotes Deuteronomy. With the word of God, Jesus returns and deals with every temptation with God's word every time swiftly. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Not only am I not bowing to you, Satan, but I'm also not tempted by your power-hungry offer. We are reminded of when Satan tempted Adam and Eve. The fruit of the garden, Genesis says, was good for food. It was a delight to the eyes, and it would make one wise. The fruit was a created thing. It was an item. But like our created things today, items become status symbols, don't they? Transmission of power to the owner. Because God had said not to eat the fruit, Eve's decision to eat the fruit when God said not to was actually an act of anti-worship against God. We don't think of sin that way, but sin is actually anti-worship. She may not have bowed down and worshipped the fruit. She may not have sung a little song to the fruit or anything like that. Uh, But her decision to 
denounce the word of God and place the desire to eat the fruit above God actually dethroned God in her heart from his rightful place of preeminence and placed a created item in that number one slot. And anytime we place a created thing above God in our lives, we worship that thing. You might say, I don't worship anything. Yes, you do. Whatever's sitting in spot number one is your God and you worship it. Your knee doesn't have to bow and you don't have to raise your hands or sing a song to worship something because worship happens in your heart and in your mind. And when we obsess over the created world, like our possessions, our, the news that we watch, the careers that we have, our future plans for life, we take a created thing and exalt it above the creator. This is the lie of attraction. The lie is that there is ultimate satisfaction to be found living for your earthly destiny. It is a lie that you will be happy sitting around all day thinking about wealth. It is a lie that you will be happy picturing checks in the mail, feeling like you already have it, and trying to magnetically attract money and wealth to you. It is a lie that obsessing over your wealth, health, prosperity, safety, and power and dreaming ways to attract it to you, to declare it, to name it, to claim it, to manifest it will make you happy in this life. You'd think that we had seen people try this before and it has never made anybody happy. Do you know that longing for all of those things, doing all of that stuff, going through the law of attraction, in no way requires you to be saved? Like You could be completely lost and absolutely work the law of attraction out in your life. The law of attraction is inherently unbiblical because it takes the mind of a lost person and the desires of an unregenerate heart and somehow magnifies them to make it the goal of our Christian experience. Newsflash, Jesus said in Luke 9.23, If anyone would come after me, let him first deny himself and take up his cross... And follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his own soul? The law of attraction and the secret and the quasi preaching of those who flirt with this stuff is designed to ruin your soul. Jesus is not a means to an end, he is the end. Colossians 1, 16 through 17 says that all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. When people talk about fulfilling their destiny, they often mean some career path or some acquisition of, of goods or status. But when Christian, when Christians talk about their destiny, I hope it means something different than that. I hope to you when you talk about, you hear the words, your destiny, that it doesn't mean the stuff that I'm going to get in the future, the power that I'm going to have. I hope that it means that you will be conformed into the image of Christ and you will bring him glory in your life or in your death. And you will be with him in his presence. And one glorious day he will return and make all things new. That is the destiny that we all should be hoping for. And so in closing, I'd like to give you the three lies of attraction. And then I will read them in opposite format to show you Satan's tactics. So we see these three lies. Number one, I should never experience trials. Number two, I am the center of the universe. And lie three, I exist to serve created things. Now let's take those three and just say them backwards just for fun. I think if you say them backwards, you'll actually get a good picture of the Christian life. Number one, God uses trials to, to strengthen me, to sanctify me. Number two, Christ is the center of the universe. And number three, I exist to glorify Christ and to serve him with my life. The law of attraction is not only incompatible with Christianity, it is patterned after Satan's very temptations to give you the wrongful desires of your heart. It exists to feed your flesh what it longs for in its unregenerate, unrepentant state. So when, you're, when your lost flesh cries out for what you want, oh, if I only had more money, if I only lost 10 pounds, if I only had more power, Satan's there to say, speak it, declare it, it's yours. Already believe it's yours. 
But none of that has anything to do with following Christ. None of it. Satan exists to give you the things that your lost heart already desires. Man, we think that Satan is out there in the tribes doing weird things, possessing people and, and rolling on the floor and, and uh, you know, doing stuff like you see in the exorcist, you know, that sort of thing. But we don't think about Satan giving us what we want in this life. We don't think about Satan coming to us and whispering in our ear, you ought to be making more money. What are you doing? Go for it. That, you need more power. Hey, don't listen to that guy. Climb over him to get to the top. You, want, you need to lose weight. Come on. Think about it. Think about it. All of those things are just nagging in our, in our brains. We, we put nice phrases around it. It's the law of attraction. Oh, focus on all the things that you need to do. Focus on wealth. Think about health. Think about safety. Boy, are we thinking about safety a lot. Focus on it. Focus on it. Think about it. Declare it. Manifest it. It's exactly what Satan does. It's exactly what Satan does. And so to challenge you today, trust in the goodness of God, in His plan for your life, and reject the temptation of Satan and the lies of the world. Serve the Creator rather than desire the gifts of creation. And I'd like to rephrase the summary of the book, The Secret. So I've taken the ending paragraph of the book and I've put, I've Christianized it, okay? So I want to read to you what the ending of this book should have said. The more you are conformed to Christ, the more power you will have to live for Him. The time to embrace the glory of Christ is now. Whatever you do, don't waste another day seeking your own way. Because the power of God is His alone. You want to hear the secret? I've got it. Okay? You don't worry about that book. I'll tell you the secret. Anybody? Gather around, children. Here is the secret to life. The secret is no secret at all. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Of which I am one and you are one. Don't waste your life trying to manifest a reality using a power that does not exist. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. You are not the center of the universe, but a holy God is. This is all His. It's all His. But this holy God wants to know and love you through a relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ. And if you would trust in Jesus today by faith, you would be saved. Repent of your sin. Pick up your cross and follow Jesus to the end. And that is the secret. Looks like the secret is out.